Today we have a guest speaker. Uh, my wife and I have been gone for the last nine days, and so uh, I didn't think if I attempted to preach today you'd get the best of me. And, uh, but that's not the only reason I really, really wanted to have the gentleman that is going to um, preach this morning here to visit First Christian Church. Uh, Travis Jacob is the director of the Advanced Center for Ministry Training. It is a brand new ministry that he will tell you about um, based out of Kissimmee Christian Church. And with the elders um, approval, I'm part of this ministry and teaching a class each Monday uh, at the Center for Training, uh, Ministry Training. Uh, Travis has been in higher education uh, most of his life uh, and has also been in local church ministry. Uh, and in the time that I've got to know him, a little over a year now, uh, he's become uh, a good friend, uh, someone that I respect, his story uh, and his experiences that he's had uh, with, with Jesus. And so he's going to come and tell you a little bit about the Advanced Center for Ministry Training. And then uh, we are actually going to have a luncheon with the missions team so he could further explain what this ministry is all about. Uh, then he's going to share a message from the Word of God. So thank you, Travis. All right. Thanks, <clears throat> well, good morning, First Christian Church, Titusville. How are you guys doing this morning? It's great. It's great to be here. Thanks, Mike, for, for inviting me, and thank you all for having me here. Um, Advanced Center for Ministry Training, um, as Mike said, is, is a brand new program that's based out of Kissimmee Christian Church in Kissimmee, but it's not a ministry of Kissimmee Christian Church. We're, we're, we are a ministry that is here to help shape to help train, to help educate visionary leaders for the Lord's church uh, right now and into the future by bringing churches all around the state and, and some other ones all around the country together to help train students in this brand new two-year certificate program. This, you can think of it as a trade school, and it's designed as an alternative to a four-year education. So we've got so many students that are coming out of high school and going into, into four-year colleges and, and Bible colleges and Christian colleges and universities. There's a huge place for that. There's also a huge place for a gap that exists within the church of training leaders in the church that don't otherwise or will not otherwise, cannot for some reason, go to a, a four-year college. So th this program was designed specifically for individuals, for people to train to be leaders in the church. And so we're, we are combining practical teaching in the classroom with practical ministry experience through a concurrent internship that will give students the opportunity to be trained in churches that are effectively reaching their community uh, through outreach programs. So it's not just a bunch of classroom training, and it's not just all about what you're doing in the church. It's bringing both of these together to help train and educate uh, visionary leaders um, for, for the church. And I want to tell you this morning that you can be proud of your senior pastor, other than the obvious fact that he's got a great looking head. He is actually a great uh, instructor. He's been a great instructor uh, for our students. He's helping shape their knowledge and helping, helping shape their thinking um, in the basic tenets of Christianity. He comes over uh, every Monday and, and trains our students. So uh, thank you for sharing him uh, with us. Our students are learning a, a great deal uh, from him. Everybody has a story to tell. Every one of us has a story to tell, and I'm privileged to be able to be here and share with you just a little bit uh, this morning. Uh, I, I tend to be a sports guy, and when I came over this morning, I was in Mike's office, and he's got his little shrine, if you've been in there. Most of you probably have. He's got his little shrine set up. Uh, to What's that team, the Yankees? No, I'm sorry. It's the Mets, right? You got to get that right, because I'm from Florida. I was born and raised in Ormond Beach, and I think you were, were you born in New York? Okay. So I got to really be careful. New Yorkers are, they're, they're tough guys. Anyway, uh, love sports. What I love most about sports though, is what happens off the court, off the field, out of the game, the ins inspirational stories 
that tend to happen that, that we can learn from. And I'm going to share a couple of those uh, stories with you uh, this morning, not only from sports, but also a key person in biblical history. But let me start off by saying in, in 1999, I was looking for something to do to help keep myself motivated and stay healthy in shape. And that was the year that I did my first triathlon. It was the shortest distance in triathlon. They call it a sprint. It's a quarter mile swim. It's a 10 mile bike ride. It's a 3.1 mile run. I figured I could stumble my way through that. The first one, I did it just to see if I was going to like it. And you know what? After the crossing the finish line and having that feeling of accomplishment, I fell in love with that sport. Over the next few years, I increased it to the longer and longer uh, races until finally in 2006, I completed my first full distance race. It's called the Iron Distance or the Iron Man, if you've heard of that before. And what that is, is a 2.4 mile swim followed by a 112 mile bike ride, followed by a 26.2 mile run. And you have to get it all done in one day. It's pretty crazy. I know. And I'm, I guess I'm pretty crazy myself. But it's, it's an awesome, awesome experience. And at first, I was motivated, like I said, by my own personal health and fitness. But over the years, as I learned more about the triathlon community, and especially the Ironman community, it became more than a personal health and fitness journey to me. You see, I began seeing inspirational stories of athletes using their personal life experiences to advance a cause. I'm gonna tell you about a couple of those. Number one, there's Rick and Dick Hoyt, the famous Team Hoyt, father and son duo who completed six Ironman races and numerous other types of races, including marathons and running the entire length of the United States. Dick's son, Rick, has cerebral palsy. He's in a wheelchair. Dad had to carry his son every mile of every race that they ever did. They used their experiences to start a foundation to advance the cause of helping people with disabilities believe that they could do anything. There's John Blaze, who completed the Ironman World Championship in 2005. The first person ever to do so with ALS, a disease that there's no cure for. His doctor said the only way he would finish is if someone rolled him across the finish line. So what did he do? He took that challenge. He beat the odds and he rolled himself across that finish line after racing for 16 and a half hours. ALS took his life two years later, but through his experience, the Blaze Man Foundation was created to advance the cause of ALS research. And there's Scott Rigsby. Scott Rigsby lost both of his legs in an auto accident when he was just 18 years old. He was the first double leg amputee to finish the Ironman World Championship in 2007 and later used his experiences to set up a foundation to advance the cause of helping wounded warriors and others do the unthinkable. Very inspiring story. But it's better than that for Scott Rigsby because Scott Rigsby is a Christian. And so what did he do? He also used his experiences as a motivational speaker all across the country and all across the world to advance the cause of the gospel. There's another man who we read about in the New Testament that used his experiences for the purpose of advancing the gospel. That man is the Apostle Paul. In his letter to the Philippian church, he said this in Philippians 1, 2, 1, 1 12. He said, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. This is the exact verse that Advanced Center for Ministry Training gets, his, gets its name for, from. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, what had happened to him? What had happened to Paul? Well, right then he was in prison when he wrote that. So there's that. And here's what he says next. He says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ because of my chains most of the brothers 
in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Paul used his experiences. Paul had so many experiences that served to help him advance the gospel. He was beaten several times. He was put in prison multiple times. He survived a shipwreck. Not to mention the fact that in his early life, he was hostile towards Christianity, persecuting the very church he would later defend to his death. He was a man full of experiences, and he used those experiences to spread the knowledge of Christ. So I want to bring this into our context today. For you, for me, for, ev- for everyone who's here, for everyone that you can give this message to. So here it is. If you are a follower of Christ, the purpose of your experiences, past, present, and future, should serve to advance the gospel making a difference in people's lives. Let me repeat that because it's very important for all of us. If you are a follower of Christ, the purpose of your experiences, what has happened in your life, past, present, and future, should serve to advance the gospel, making a difference in people's lives. And this morning, I want to share with you four lessons that I learned from looking at the life of Paul that I believe can help us all as we use our experiences for the purpose of advancing the gospel for Christ. And by the way, Paul uses analogies of races and running in several of the letters that he wrote, like the one he uses in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get that prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. They do it to get a medal that will not last. They do it to get a trophy that, not, that, that will not last. But we do it. We run our race as Christ followers, as Christians. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. And how much better can it be than that? Paul used these examples of of running and he uses examples of races uh, in in many of his letters. And he used those examples because at the time, the Olympic Games and other competitive races and events in Rome and Greece were already happening when he was writing these things. So it's not new. The people related to it. He was giving something that they can relate to. So following that example, here we go. Four lessons that will help us use our experiences for the purpose of advancing the gospel. Lesson number one, keep your eye on the goal. Keep your eye on the goal. Paul kept his eye on goals. He kept his eye on the most important goals. He kept his eye on spiritual goals. We read what he has to say about this in Philippians, the third chapter. He talks about focusing on a righteousness in his life that only comes from God and knowing him and the power of the resurrection. And with that focus in mind, he says in verses 13 and 14, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Paul, the apostle Paul, kept his mind on the goal. Florence Chadwick was an American swimmer known for long distance open water swimming. She was the first woman to swim the English Channel in both directions, setting a time record each time. She was also the first woman to swim the Catalina Channel, the Straits of Gibraltar, the Bosporus, and the Dardanelles. In 1952, Florence attempted for the first time to swim the 26 miles between Catalina Island and the California coastline. As she began, she was flanked by small boats on both sides that watched for sharks and were prepared to help her if she grew, uh, got hurt or grew tired. After about 15 hours of swimming, a thick fog set in. Florence began to doubt her ability, and she told her mother, who was in one of the boats, that she did not think she could make it. She swam for another hour before asking to be pulled out, unable to see the coastline because of the thick fog that had set in. As she sat in the boat, she found out. 
that she stopped swimming just one mile from her destination. She swam for 26 miles. She had one more to go. And she dropped out. Be Why? We're going to find out. Two months later, she tried again. That same thick fog set in. But she succeeded this time in reaching Catalina because as she said, here's the key, she kept a mental image of the shoreline in her mind while she swam. So that first time she was unsuccessful, she took her eye off the goal. The second time, that mental image of the shoreline was the goal. She kept that in her, in, uh, that in her, uh, in her mind, and this time she succeeded. So I want to ask you this morning, what is your goal? Do you have any goals? And specifically, spiritual goals. Do you need to make it your goal to share the gospel, maybe with a family member, friend, maybe a coworker? Do you need to make it your goal to maybe get out of debt so that you can have financial freedom and be able to give more? Do you need to make it your goal to serve in a ministry that is helping others in some way? Whatever goal you have, make it and keep your eye on it. Don't lose sight of it. Lesson number two, when the going gets tough, keep going. In Acts 14, Paul was with Barnabas in the city of Lystra and something interesting happened. He healed a man who was crippled. The people of Lystra thought Paul and Barnabas, because of their customs and their traditions, they thought Paul and Barnabas were the Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes. But after they told them that they were just regular men sent from God, the crowds were persuaded, instead of helping them, persuaded to stone Paul, and they dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. The going got pretty tough for Paul right then. But when the disciples gathered around him, he got up and he kept going. He continued on city after city, starting churches and spreading the gospel because he didn't let the, the, the tough slow him down. The going got tough, but he kept, go, kept going. At the 1992 Olympic Games in Barcelona, British sprinter Derek Redman was in great shape. He posted the fastest time of the first round and went on to win his quarterfinal. In the semifinal, Redmond started well, but in the back straight, about 250 meters from the finish, his hamstring tore. He hobbled to a halt and then fell to the ground in pain. Stretcher bears made their way over to him, but Redmond decided he wanted to finish the race. He began to hobble along the track. He was soon joined on the track by his father, Jim Redman, who barged past security and onto the track to get to his son. Jim and Derek completed that lap of the track together, with Derek leaning on his father's shoulder for support. And then, as they crossed the finish line, the crowd of 65,000 spectators rose up to give Derek a standing ovation. However, because his father had helped him finish, Derek was officially disqualified. Although Redmond was disqualified and listed as did not finish due to, the outside, uh, due to his outside assistance, the incident has become a well-remembered moment in Olympic sports history. Having been the subject of one of the International Olympic Committee's Celebrate Humanity videos and been used in advertisements like Visa as an illustration of the Olympic spirit, and featured in Nike's Courage commercials in 2008, if you remember those. Despite knowing that he would be disqualified instead of giving up when the going got tough, he kept going. He was at the Olympics to represent his company, or I'm sorry, his country. And he was going to cross that finish line no matter what. And you know what, in, in life, things get tough, don't they? Things can be hard sometimes. Life is hard sometimes. We all have experienced sudden loss. Every one of us has in some way. Loss of a job, loss of a loved one, loss of everything we own, as many people are facing now, especially in Southwest Florida and maybe around this area too. Maybe you've had to fight through cancer or some other debilitating health conditions, whatever it is. Yes, life can be tough, but we serve a God who can keep us going. When the going gets tough, keep going. Lesson number three, 
When you get off track, get back in the right direction. In Acts 27 and 28, we read of a time when Paul was on his way to Rome. He was on a ship in the Mediterranean Sea, and a massive storm came up. The ship was violently being thrown by the waves until it struck a reef just off the island of Malta. Paul, along with 275 other passengers, was shipwrecked. After spending three months on that island, he got back in the right direction he was originally headed and went on to Rome to continue his purpose of spreading the gospel. And by the way, even when he was shipwrecked on that island for those three months, he allowed God to use him in great ways with the people there. So even when he was off track, he was still finding ways to use his experiences. Every runner's and race director's worst nightmare came true at the Portland Marathon in Oregon in 2019. As 14 of the top 15 runners went off course at mile nine and ended up on a freeway. 22-year-old Callan Kahn of the Bowerman Track Club was way out in front. And fortunately for him, his Portland police motorcycle escort knew the course, directing him into the right-hand turn a little after mile nine. But the chase pack was too far back, and they didn't see where Khan turned. And between 14 and 20 runners kept going straight instead of making the turn, adding between 10 and 20 minutes to their final race and putting themselves in danger on a road that was not closed to traffic. The crazy thing is that this incident was the result of a misinformed bystander directing runners to go straight, since there was no sign indicating that they should turn right near the entrance to the Ross Island Bridge. They ended up on a main thoroughfare that was not closed to traffic, but ultimately, the runners found their way back to the course a couple of miles further south to get back on track, and they finished the race. And sometimes in our lives, it's easy to get off track. It was easy for those guys to get off track. But life happens. We get distracted, don't we? So many things are happening all around us. We were doing so well, and then all of a sudden we realize, you know what, we haven't been praying. We haven't been reading our Bible like we set out to do. We haven't been going on that weekly date with our spouse. We haven't been keeping up with someone to in- encourage them. We haven't been doing this. We haven't been doing that. We're just, we're just off track. Whatever the reason, when you get off track, do what you have to do to get back in the right direction. And we, saw, we see Paul do that over and over again. Lesson number four, celebrate victories. Celebrate victories. Paul speaks of the greatest spiritual victory in 1 Corinthians 13 as he writes to the believers in Corinth when he reminds them that ultimately death, he's talking about spiritual death, is swallowed up in victory. And through our Lord Jesus Christ, God gives us our spiritual victory. In verse 55 through 58, listen to what he says. He says, O death, Where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, with the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Paul knew no greater victory. And he celebrated that. One of the biggest victory celebrations in the history of sports for the United States involved Russia or the Soviet Union in the 1980 Winter Olympic Games. The US Olympic hockey team was facing the Soviet Union. The Soviets had won the gold medal in five of the six previous Olympic Games and they were the favorite to win once more in Lake Placid that year. The Soviet team consisted primarily of professional players and with significant experience in international play. And by contrast, the United States team, if you remember this, was composed mostly of amateur players with only four players with minimal minor league experience. The United States has the, had the youngest team in the tournament that year and the youngest team in U.S. team history. They were not supposed to win. 
For the first game in the medal round, the United States played, yes, the Soviets, finishing the first period tied at two, and the Soviets leading three to two following the second. The U.S. team scored two more goals to take their first lead midway through the third and final period. Then the unthinkable happened. They held on to win that game four to three. Two days later, the U.S. won the gold medal by beating Finland in their final game. That first round game against the Soviet Union was named the Miracle on Ice. No one was supposed to beat the Soviets that year, especially not a very young and inexperienced United States team. So you can only imagine the celebration that took place that night. And that one victory continues to be celebrated 42 years later. Let me ask you this. What victories can you celebrate right now? Look around at what God is doing in your life and celebrate even the smallest victories, we can all think of victories. If God has used an experience in your life to help someone out in even the smallest way, celebrate that. If he has used an experience in your life in a big way, celebrate that and find those victories to celebrate. I love talking about using our experiences to help advance the gospel because it, it, it is about sharing hope. I, I love how, uh, Mike, how you did communion this morning and talked about the hope, the hope that not only those people on that mountain had, but the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. There's no greater hope. And we've got to use our experiences to help people find that same hope. So four lessons that will help us use our experiences for the purpose of advancing the gospel. Number one, keep your eye on the goal. Number two, when the going gets tough, keep going. Number three, when you get off track, get back in the right direction. And number four, celebrate victories. In the summer of 2019, I preached a sermon entitled 13 Boxes. And by the way, if we're going to use our experiences to help advance the gospel, there's times where we just have to be transparent with people. And so you all are my friends now. So I'm going to be a little bit transparent with you because that's what our experiences are all about. So in the summer of 19, 2019, I preached a sermon entitled 13 Boxes. I talked about how the year 2017, just two years earlier, was the hardest year of my life. I was alone. I didn't have full-time employment. I couldn't afford the apartment that I was in. And I would lay there at night with a deep physical pain in my chest. You might have experienced that before too. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I just lay there and stare at the ceiling, praying to God that he would get me through. Eventually, I was able to get out of my lease in this apartment that I couldn't afford, and I went to stay with friends who had an extra room. So here I am renting a room from, from friends, and at that point, all my belongings, everything I owned besides my clothes and my bike, were packed in 13 boxes and stored in another friend's garage. It was the lowest time of my life. And in that message, I talked about all the details, including turning to God instead of so many other things that could have destroyed my life as so many other people do in that situation. I got closer to God during that time than I had ever had before. So I talked about my experiences, which included God blessing me beyond what I could have ever imagined by leading me to the perfect woman for me that very next year and marrying her on the beach right down the street in Coco. So it turned out great, but it was through those experiences uh, and, and, and staying close to God and not getting off track and doing my best that he blessed me beyond what, what, what I could ever imagine. And I preached that sermon four services that weekend. And after each one, I had a line of people come up and tell me, not that I did a good job, not that they, you know, not, not how, what, anything else, but that they could relate because they had been in a similar situation at some point in their lives. And one guy, one guy, I will never forget. 
he came up to me and he said, I really, really appreciate what you had to say. He goes, three months ago, I was sitting in a chair in my living room with a gun pointed to my head and my finger on the trigger, ready to end it all. Because I was at that lowest point in my life too. And he said, only God saved me. But what you said helps because I know that I'm not the only one who has been through something like this before. But it was all about sharing experiences, nothing else. The purpose of my experience in that situation served to advance the gospel that weekend. But it wouldn't have happened had I not been willing to share my experiences. You see, Paul understood the purposes of his experiences, every single one of them. Shipwreck, there's, there, there's a purpose for that. Being in jail, there's a purpose for that. Being stoned, there's a purpose for that. Everything that he went through, he knew that there was a purpose for it. And that purpose was to advance the gospel. So let me finish by asking you this. How will you use your experience for the purpose of advancing the gospel? You see, we all have experiences. Every single one of us does. Use your experiences. Use them. And watch what God will do. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for um, experiences in our lives, experiences that we live through that you use through us uh, to reach somebody with the hope of eternal life and the hope of, of advancing the gospel uh, in some way. And we thank you so much for the example of Paul uh, throughout the New Testament, time and time again, could have just given up, could have just quit, could have just you know, said, you know, this isn't worth it. But he didn't do that. He stayed the course whenever, whatever it was. He didn't let anything get him down. He didn't let anything stop him. He knew what his purpose was. And he knew the job that he needed to do. And he helped advance the gospel in ways that we could never have imagined. And we thank you so much for his example. We thank you so much for speaking to us through him through the word. And God, just, I pray for each person in this room here. I pray, I pray that you will bless their lives. I pray that you will bless their families. I pray that you will uh, open up some thoughts, open up some thoughts in, in each person's mind of ways that we can all use our experiences to advance the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.